Bueno, pues buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Muchas gracias por, por regresar o por venir. No sé si estuvisteis ayer. Pero bueno, tenemos una oportunidad de continuar la conversación que iniciamos eh, y que como ya pude eh, apuntar eh, en la sesión anterior, partía un poco de la publicación que hemos trabajado para la exposición de Teresa Lanceta, un código, eh, código abierto. Y, y a partir de esa experiencia que ayer empezamos a, a trabajar desde la idea de, de lo encarnado, de lo corporal, de lo sonoro, de lo sónico, eh, y que nos llevó luego a las salas para continuar con esa, con esa actuación de iniciativa sexual femenina y después de Bonaventure, pensábamos que, que sería interesante eh, que en esta segunda convocatoria pudiéramos dar continuidad a esa, a esa primera aproximación y desbordar las páginas de... De la, de la publicación y así entrar en una conversación sobre otras posibles genealogías y otras maneras de afrontar el acto de tejer eh, como código abierto y abordar cuestiones que tienen que ver con la deslocalización, con la migración, con lo ecológico, eh, con la libertad sexual, con eh, diferentes planteamientos que vamos a poder ver de la mano de Natasha Jingala y también de Grant Watson que ahora os presentaré porque van a introducir sus, sus investigaciones en unos minutos. Y simplemente quería recordaros que después eh, volveremos a subir a las salas en esta ocasión acompañadas de Luz Pitzel, una magnífica poeta que va a hacer una, un recital junto con Teresa Lanceta eh, para dar un poco ese retorno al lenguaje migrante, al lenguaje eh, mayor, menor, eh, que nos permite continuar trabajando desde la edición en un sentido amplio, ¿no? desde el textil y desde el texto. Eh, Natasa nos está esperando eh, y voy a hacer una breve presentación de, tanto de su currículum como de, del de Grant Watson y, y luego subiremos y tendremos una conversación después de que ambos terminen. Eh, Natasha, I'm going to briefly introduce you in Spanish and then I will uh, hand over to you. Just, I'm just translating very quickly where, where we're at because I don't think you can hear what I'm saying in Spanish. So. Um, Natasha es una curadora de arte, de arte contemporánea, es autora y es editora eh, y vive entre Colombo en Sri Lanka y, y Berlín. Eh, es conservadora o curadora asociada de Gropius Baus en Berlín y también la directora artística de Columboscope en Sri Lanka, uno de los proyectos que hoy nos contará con más, con más detalle y sobre el que tengo muchas ganas de escuchar, de escuchar más. Eh, además, también es la directora artística junto con Daphne Ayas de, de One June Biennial de 2021. Y además escribe eh, con frecuencia sobre arte, sobre cultura visual y ha hecho numerosos, eh, numerosos libros, numerosas publicaciones, entre las que destacan Stronger Than Bone, Knights of the Dispossessed, Rider and Bone, entre, entre otras. Y además, eh, tanto como uh, Grant eh, y Bona han tenido relación con diferentes centros educativos como el DAI, también Documenta 14 fue parte de, del equipo curatorial y estuvo involucrada en la labor allí. Eh, el, en el caso de Grant, que también voy a introducir brevemente su, su currículum, eh, él además de ser eh, un amigo y colaborador desde hace ya unos años, trabaja en el Royal College of Art como profesor e investigador y también en el DAI, como decía antes, el Dutch Art Institute. Es además doctor eh, por Goldsmiths University y fue becado por Bach hace apenas unos años también, donde siempre en línea con lo que él trabaja, eh, hizo una investigación eh, de largo plazo, ¿no? trabaja una cuestión duracional en su práctica uh, curatorial e investigadora y uno de sus proyectos eh, que, que creo que podremos escuchar un poquito más gracias a Radio MACVA eh, es How We Behave, uh, que fue parte de su tesis doctoral y que inició en 2012 y todavía continúa. Pero hoy aquí también nos va a hablar de um, textile politics, de las políticas del textil, que es otro de los proyectos que, que está en curso y que, que, que viene a colación con, con los temas que, que hoy aquí nos convocan. Y bueno, ha hecho numerosas exposiciones, numerosos proyectos, como estuvo involucrado en Bauhaus Imaginista, eh, una gran exposición que tiene que ver también con esta importancia de, de, del textil, eh, en el caso del que hoy aquí también estamos hablando, ideas que tienen que ver con la transculturalidad eh, y, como decía antes, eh, una aproximación a, a la habilidad social eh, de la práctica artística. Y bueno, yo creo que sin más voy a dar paso a Natasha, eh, Uh, es importante mencionar el título, el título de, su, de su... Voy a buscarlo en inglés, para, lo tengo en castellano, pero para no equivocarme. Eh, 
porque creo que es importante que a partir de ahí construya esa narrativa que nos ha preparado. ¿no? Eh, en castellano es voy tejiendo tu nombre en el telal de mi mente, pero en inglés, para que ella me entienda, Natasha, I'm going to say the title in English now so you can go ahead right after, uh, es uh, I weave your name on the loom of my mind. Así que os dejo con ella y a, a continuación seguimos, seguimos hablando. Gracias. The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, first of all, to um, everybody at MACPA and, of course, the curators, uh, Noria and Laura, who have been extremely generous um, also in uh, providing me the fundamental learning around uh, Teresa Lanceta's uh, incredible corpus of life and work. Um, the catalog is, is brilliant and it has been um, an important resource for me that I will be drawing from in parts today as well. Um, I also uh, want to acknowledge, uh, of course, the work of uh, Elvira. Um, uh, it's very inspiring to have her lead this institution um, and also to accompany uh, my uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Bonaventure So Beijing Nikung's uh, Sonic Weaving yesterday um, and Grant Watson, who has been uh, a collaborator and someone I actually have followed since I was a student in New Delhi. Um, so it's been, it's been a long uh, uh, friendship uh, and a great respect respect for one another's work. To begin, let us invoke the weave of philosophy spun by mystic poet weaver Kabir, born in the 15th century in Banaras, now Varanasi in India. He drew from currents of Hindu bhakti and Sufi knowledge, equally from the livelihood of cloth trade. This song is featured in the Kabir project led by Shabnam Virmani. It is a project from 20 years of archiving and traverses the spiritual and material journey of finely spun cloth. Weaving, washing and dyeing connects to practices of treating the body, the fabric of being with care, deep generosity and awareness, Sheila as well as recognizing divine nature, extending lessons through implements of spinning, such as the charka or spinning wheel. Different communities have sung the song that we will listen to a fragment of it. Since various generations with variations resounding across the territories that we speak of today as India and Pakistan. I will continue after we play this video fragment. Oh, 
कबीरा जब हम पैदा हुए कबीरा जब हम जब हम पैदा हुए तो जग हसे हम रोए चलो तो हम हसे चदरिया चीनी रे I'm not sure if the subtitles worked for you. Um, if they didn't, I'm gonna I'm gonna translate this one, uh, just in case. So the singer here um, is Muktiar Ali, and he was singing really the story of that cloth, um, the processes, the timelines, the act of making the cloth and the purification process, the dyeing process, all become spiritually bound uh, with ideas of selfhood. He is a performer of Sufiana Kalam and Bhakti songs from a village called Pugal in the westernmost part of the state of Rajasthan in India. He belongs to the Mirasi community who historically inhabit North India and parts of Pakistan carrying on their ancestral enterprise as musicians attached to shrines, temples, hermitages, marking marriage ceremonies and seasonal ritual. They are known to be keepers of genealogies, family trees. The body as cloth figured within a composition of ethics and as boundless, uncut, unstitched cosmic self echoes in other couplets and oral transmissions of the poet weaver Kabir too. As an interpreter of his philosophy, my mother mentions that the objective of creating finer cloth is linked to taking a courageous path. And when Kabir sings of the stains and blots that take hold of the cloth, 
that is given corporeality as the keeper of a spirit, he is urging for all encompassing love as the way to arrive at a clearing of transformed action. Entering into another poetic universe, that of Chilean poet artist, Cecilia Vicuña. Practices observed from Andean women shamans and sacred wordplay of pre-Columbian Americas meet here with enduring violence of colonial occupation, erasures of indigenous knowledge, dying languages and ecological ruin. Just as she hums, chants and utters words that are composite rememberings, she drafts offerings from natural and artificial materials. Feathers, shells, driftwood, wool, scraps of fabric yield hundreds of precarios, precarious things, and basuritas, a little litter as she calls them. Cecilia makes a circle of colored powder on a Pacific beach. She ties strings between boulders near a Peruvian lake. These gestures or sense-making arrangements are her ways of listening with the fingers and recognizing the poem as spatial metaphor. This is one line that really stayed with me as I was also thinking about this exhibition. Thread is a trail I'm lost on and the trail is a scent I travel. This is from her book, Unraveling Words and the Weaving of Water. More and more, we learn of textile makers and designers reusing dead stock, repairing and reusing fabric as parts of new design collections. These actions are of course welcome, but when accompanied by statements limited to trend setting that reveal cultural amnesia, one is reminded of the numerous weavers and dyers who have been pursuing modes of circular economy for generations. I feel extremely lucky to have crossed paths with some of them. I'm also reminded of Cecilia Vicuña's statement, we are made of throwaways and we will be thrown away. In observing Vicuña's practice of building kipus as solitary and collective offerings, I think now to Teresa Lanceta's words, every knot is a thought. Vicuña's approach to drawing from these ink and record keeping devices in dyed wool and other ma material crossings register time in complex ways. It is the time of human exile and connective possibility while also remembering geologics, temporality, ecocides. Today, I would like to share with you from intergenerational set of practices, artistic vocabularies emerge from South Asia and its diaspora while interweaving some of the lessons I've personally drawn from the work of Teresa Lanceta and Cecilia Vicuña. These practices have inspired me in framing this presentation in terms of poetics and politics of textile, but also of addressing textile practices, as Laura has already mentioned, in relation to migration, displacement, and creating room for radical mobility. Here, I'm setting a resonance with Lanceta's tapestries of movement and dense cohabitation, as in the Raval, which she writes about in detail. So too with Cecilia Vicuña's poem manifesto, Language is Migrant, which was a guiding text for the seventh edition of Columboscope, an interdisciplinary arts festival in Sri Lanka. For the latest edition, I would acknowledge that I work closely with Delhi-based curator Anushka Rajendran. These are just three out of over 50 practices that we engaged with over three years. Aris Katki, whose work you see here, challenges the dichotomies of art and craft as they have inherited and 
they have been inherited and canonized in modern art, particularly across Euro-American conventions. Instead, reaching into Zoroastrian practices, sites, and traditions, his Persian inheritance and the itinerancy that it brings forth, his movement from Bombay to Aotearoa, New Zealand, his proximity with the Parsi community across generations, picking up threads and methods from matriarchs in his myths, including his mother, grandmother, and aunts. Kadki traces the role of textile and embroidery as a way to exchange pleasure, animate queer virtuosity, register heirlooms, and chronicle wavered lives to borrow from Sadia Hartman. Rather than focusing on the grandeur and finery of brocades, embroidered silk garas, and quilted bridal mantles that find a pride of place in the Parsi textile tradition, Aris uses functional cloths sourced from his home, surrounding, and travels to Iran, former Persia, Gujarat, Greece, and West Azerbaijan. Tablecloths, rags, tea towels, khadi handkerchiefs, and shoulder cloths. These connect intrinsically to the laboring and dreaming body. They are scaled as such to grasp intimacy, cloth as second skin. The artist refuses claims of Adolf Luce in ornament and crime, as perhaps Lancetta does too, conjoining with Southern modalities and rituals of use and value. Navar initiation or Zoroastrian priesthood is one of the works you see here, and it depicts vessels from Zoroastrian fire temples that he has observed in Gujarat, the first place of exile for Zoroastrians. The fire has been an eternal motif, the final point of prayer, the fire of the sun transmitted then to the fire that has been kept burning by this community over centuries. Udvada, another work, uses fragments of a 200-year-old sadre muslin belonging to the artist's great-grandfather. It is worn by Zoroastrians as a blessed undergarment with a girdle worn around the waist and wound three times with daily prayer, the kasti. These textile amulets and protection shields bring forth the spiritual life force of materials. Here you have a view of the work that was produced for the Columbus Cope exhibition, Language is Migrant. And we will look at a detailed view further on. But let me quote from a catalog entry um, of Ariz's recent exhibition with Australia-based Hazara artists from Afghanistan, um, and then his family moved to Pakistan, Khadim Ali, two positions uh, that map displacement and movement. This exhibition was called There is No Other Home But This at Govard Brewster Gallery in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Ari's notes of developing biomythographic entwining between text and textile. The biomythographic seems to be um, a really interesting device, which again also was something I, I sort of observed when reading the dialogues uh, between the authors uh, and Teresa Lanzetta, the way in which there is a chronicling from memory, but also from collective experience, from the co-authorship that has been developed over decades. Aris writes, Perhaps we'll find a subcontinent crammed inside your neighbor's home. A little brown cry or a kiss between strangers, land that wasn't subdivided or annexed by oceans, bodies emerging from bodies. I thought of our various elsewheres having migrated with us, like stowaway bees in our pockets, having extracted nectar from lands that have nourished and sheltered. In this new quartet called Words Are Pilgrims, we see a set of handkerchiefs that become a place of convergence and mark making for words bearing Persian roots that have settled into the English tongue, such as musk, 
khaki, algebra, and alcohol. These words, like traveling bodies, become hybrids and leave tracings of their crossings. They are anchored by the artist to the four elements of nature. He creates these ciphers and symbols to interpret the travel and transit of these words, perhaps also signaling to Spivak's notion of planetarity as premised on a practice of reading. Poems, he notes, can be like blueprints or drafts for visual material. They help me discern what I'd like to illuminate, suggest, or perhaps redact. This work is by a young artist uh, from Sri Lanka, Hema Sharoni. Uh, we have been uh, collaborating through the platform of Columboscope for some years now. And the importance from here is to actually also address internal displacement, displacement within the island country uh, itself that has been through decades of civil war. In this work that was made by Shironi um, during her studies in Lahore in Pakistan, she uh, was given this quilt by a friend and she used it as the surface uh, for this work called Doorway, uh, which in fact is a, in a sense also brings in the play of fantasy um, and also the way in which she chooses to revive um, her own memories of displacement of the homes that have been rented of temporary settlements and shelters that have been lived in through the temporality of the war and these are placed onto different different floors so in, in what she misses in her own lifeline um, the possibility to be in the midst of all of the homes um, that she has inhabited with her family, moving from the central province to the northern province, um, and then studying also within the country in the north, and then traveling further to Pakistan. All of these homes are mapped onto uh, this quilt, and the doors open is also for her, as she notes, a way of marking uh, the movement and the swirl of memory in ways that is nonlinear. Also marking ways in which uh, neighbors who have been left behind can perhaps, at least in the mind, be collected and brought together to reframe uh, the kind of uh, shared spaces that were created. This is just one such practice um, that I have learned immensely from that moves away from centralizing tendencies toward different formations um, of processual artistic engagement. These practices expand spatial domains and experiences of locatedness as ways of sourcing and otherwise, or to use Ariella Azoulay's phrase, excavating potential histories. Bundles of Joy is another work by the artist that signifies the joy of homecoming and the threat of eviction. The ephemerality of home in her case and the strangeness of NGO funded temporary settlements as well as post housing, post war state housing schemes. Each bundle is then made from sourced textiles such as home furnishing linen old saris and fancy prints that are brought from the market. These are scattered in her midst and she recalls the ways that she observes her mother and grandmother, their skill at tailoring, but also at making meaning and producing new textile from these remnants. The Walking House is another recent work. And here, Shironi again goes back to the time when she was studying in Lahore. Um, this work was completed across the two geographies of Pakistan and Sri Lanka during the time of lockdowns and while attending virtual classes from her hostel. These translucent layers uh, of the installation, they convey an architecture of longing, but also the seeking of comfort in the home. She reaches out to her mother and her family 
to catch detailed glimpses of the home. So here you see the window and from there, the neighborhood beyond. You see the doorway that has the, um, the thoran, which is a door hanging that is a sign of welcome and good luck. But also the animal members of the household. Here you note the chicken coops. So this form um, is something that I'm very, very um, interested to think about um, in the way that it spatializes um, from subjective memory, especially in spaces where there is a forced amnesia and there are ways in which one's own life lifetime of um, archiving, photographing and documenting one's practice is continuously under threat due to forced mobility. Collage Letters um, is another work that, um, that she has made um, that brings to the foreground symmetries, asymmetries of news forecast and personal communique. She stitches from magazines found on the streets while also recollecting from reserves of interior remembrance, anecdotes and marginalia that hide or are easily cast aside. It also indicates how defiant speech emerges in a context beset with linguistic hegemony. She comes from a family that is inherently multilingual, speaking Tamil and Sinhala, the two languages of the island that have been at loggerheads, but not the only ones, the ones that have been under perpetual war and created a huge amount of animosities. The processes of recovery are such as this work, which are still ongoing. I'm reminded of Cecilia's opening up of language to recover its inventive potential. She notes, my work is really multilingual and it, and it includes languages I don't even know myself, meaning languages I feel. I sense they exist because I hear them as a murmur, a sound, a concept. They're unknown. They may have existed already, or maybe they will in the future. Lancetta writes in time and hours, how many hours does a rug have? How many hours did a woman spend making it? How many hours was she paid for her work? What needs can she meet by selling her rugs? Women weavers are crushed by a comfortable demand that shatters the unitary time of their lives, turning it into working hours torn out of existence itself. Timekeeping through units of labor is part of neoliberal calculability. So I'm asking how may we treat the rug as a cosmology of timekeeping, relating it as a cultural repository as part of agrarian and seasonal cycles that offer a different role in marking social existence and symbols of identity formation. I return to the quilt, the godri or dharki as it is called in Gujarat and especially in the Kutch province, the desert province that is an immense treasure of embroidery practices and weaving practices as well as natural dyeing. The Godri or Dharki, I'm going to show you an example of one that I got many years ago from Kutch. Since I'm here sitting at my desk, I can show you what's around me. A covering to lie on, uh, lie under uh, while on a cart, that is uh, a wooden uh, bed under the stars. The same quilt made of fragments, salvage cloths, some precious, others oddly sized and recycled out of necessity. The same wrap, that, it, that is used for an infant as it is for an elder. It is these ancestral possessions and the knowledge they hold of textile history itself that perhaps need our attention, reams of study. The one that I want to show you here, you see it, all of the different um, stitches that are used. and also the two-sided nature of it, of course. This is all handmade. 
and it was given to me while traveling through uh, the desert areas where this practice is continued. Most of the communities there um, have been historically nomadic, but they now inhabit different pockets and each village um, practices its own style. And that is also a way of recognizing that particular community. One realizes often how our understanding around woven materials through familiarity born from kinship is worn lightly and perhaps therefore also neglected. For instance, when my cat paws at the silk and cotton cushions with thin bowl stripes that lie on the bed cover, I yell to warn him, not the mushroom. The term mushroom means permitted, derived from mashri in Arabic and misri or misru, referring to a mixture in Sanskrit. Mushroom is a woven cloth that is very becoming very rare these days, especially in large quantities. It is historically a blend of silk and cotton. It was it was used, it was made through hand woven techniques with satin silk fabric in the Indian subcontinent. It still is, but now the quantities are in way smaller uh, scale and one has to look hard to find it. The proper use of just this one specific textile is mentioned as far back as the 16th century in the Mughal text, N. E. Akbari. And this is just information I'm sharing with you because there's so much to a name and a particular style and one has simply heard this name from, from one's family and that brings uh, to the foreground a sense of recognition. But yet the translation, uh, the learning of the technique, those are things that are becoming rapidly lost. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I have, um, but the last artist that I'd like to uh, talk to you about today is um, another young Sri Lankan artist uh, who we worked with um, closely called Vinoja Tharmalingam. Um, she approaches her artistic role with quiet rigor Hers is a quest to bring to the fore experiences of oppressed figures who are sidelined even within minor historiographies, memory keeping and commemoration. Her textile art examines how objects and sites convey experiences of loss and abandonment. She uses pieces of a wheelchair. She refers to bunkers, to decimated homes and Sri Lanka's landmine contamination that has killed thousands and continues to keep people under threat in forested areas in Northern Sri Lanka. Drafting from a common experience, the civil war is resituated through the evidence born in disabled bodies, the afterlives of widows and orphans. Living between the Northern province in Kilinochi and Batikalo in the East, Vinoja teaches and makes work is also part of a group called Artists for Nonviolent Living, raising public consciousness and civic activism through creative processes engaging war affected communities. Some of her work is also recalling uh, these different regions of the island and their experiences, in particular during the concluding episodes of the Civil War, as well as her own forced displacement to India by boat. Vinoja marks aerial views of specific sites during the war years as subjective maps that emerge through visual chronicling of intergenerational trauma and buried memory. They exist as trace evidence and coded expressions, dissecting, uh, sorry, dissenting against repression and silencing by the military government of the island country. They also gesture to the unfinished quest of justice and the work of mourning. Just to put it into perspective, um, the scale of what we are talking about here, when referring to um, a recent um, Human Rights Watch article, um, I read Sri Lanka has the world's second highest number of cases registered with the United Nations Working Group for no Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances. 
Since the 1980s, an estimated 60,000 to 100,000 people from all ethnic and religious communities have disappeared. Many victims are believed to have been abducted, tortured, and killed by government security forces, including units operating under the country's current political and military leaders. Vinoja's Bunker series builds on experiences of the many makeshift sites used by war-affected Tamil communities in the northern and eastern Sri Lanka. These are ways in which she provides a reminder of what it meant to find safety amidst food and medical scarcities and scorching heat. Using different found fabrics in her work also indicates grounded memories of how improvised sandbags were stitched together from old saris while digging bunkers in sandy terrains. Yet Vinoja also observes these spaces as architectures of survival and conviviality. She terms them as important places of homemaking and of everyday life. In these works, we observe the stitch as a murmuration against forgetting and a subversion of linear time. Think of the time of a landmine. Through meticulously placed dots, cloth patches, burns, and lines, she composes for us an experiential ground. I conclude with this quote by Cecilia Vicuña from Languages Migrant. When I am asked about the role of the poet in our times, I only question, are we a listening post? Composing an impossible survival guide, as Paul Chan has said, or are we going silent in the face of our own destruction? Thank you. I look forward to joining you for questions. Natasha, I don't know if you can hear, you can, can you hear me? Sure, I can. Ah, sorry. <laughs> no, I was going, just going to mention that we're going to go straight to Grant and then we have a conversation, the three of us and the public, if that's okay. I meant at the end, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you, Laura and Yolanda <coughs> and Elvira and Teresa and everybody for coming. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, I love being in these dis textile related discussions. Um, tonight, I'm going to, I'm not going to refer to the work in the exhibition or the work of Teresa, which I've just encountered for the first time. Um, but I'm going to <clears throat> talk about the term textile politics um, and drawing on my own sort of archive that I've been building up um, over some time uh, and give some examples of that. I think I wasn't listening very clearly to the device in my ear, but I think that you might have said that I continue certain things over certain kinds of research over long periods of time. Um, so I want to start, um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a text actually, which is about 30 minutes long. I'm going, to, I'm going to start as a sort of preamble by going back to the 1980s. Um, so in the late 1980s, early 1990s, I did a degree in textiles where I learned to screen print, to weave, to dye and to make patchwork. 
So I'd always intended to go to art college, originally as a painter, but the choice to do textiles was informed by my interest in uh, the post-punk street fashion of that time in which the semiotics of textiles played an important role. I was aware of this scene through the magazine such as The Face and ID, but more immediately from my own experience of collecting textiles from charity shops and jumble sales and improvising with secondhand clothes that I customized and reinterpreted into what we might think now of as a queer aesthetic. <clears throat> At that time, I wasn't thinking in terms of a textile politics, but looking back, I can see that these activities were part of a wider counterculture where music and fashion in particular operated as forms of political expression. Much of what I think went on, much of this I think went on to be appropriated through a concerted depoliticization during the 1990s of the conflicts and energies of the previous decade morphing into a consumer culture which was able to take the libertarian elements of the counterculture and edit out its most radical potential, which included the rejection of the mainstream, of gender norms, and the establishing of different kinds of small-scale autonomous economies, often based on reuse, handmade exchange, and making something from nothing, to borrow a phrase from Lucy Lippard. At that time, I wasn't able to think in terms of a textile politics, but several decades later, around 2008, having passed by then through different academic settings, I was able to go back to textiles and think about them more clearly in terms of a material history that's linked, that is linked to gender and sexuality, but also to histories of colonization, questions of trade, of labor, and the appropriation of some cultural forms at the same time as the eradication of others. At that time, I was living in Antwerp and was spurred on by a long history of textile production in Flanders, as well as the experimental fashion scene in the city to create an exhibition called Textiles, Art and the Social Fabric, which was the first of a series of ongoing curatorial projects addressing textile politics with which I'm still busy. The idea of textile politics, or textiles as politics, is at the heart of a recently published book, Frey, Art and Textile Politics, by Julia Bryan Wilson. In it, she says, she says of it, this is the first scholarly book of its kind, because it puts the term textile politics on the table and then fleshes it out through a brief historical survey in which she points to the many ways in which textiles themselves or else the consideration of their production, circulation, and use can be seen as a challenge to the social order. Including in her account how Marx and Engels drew extensively on textile manufacturing and trade to theorize the development of capitalism. It has often been noted that textiles and text share a common source in the Latin word texari, to weave, but paradoxically, textiles has for many years been a medium without a discourse. Wilson points out that there is by now a colossal literature inspired by textiles, scattered across the disparate fields of anthropology, the decorative arts, economics, history, sociology, and material culture. But a specific focus on textiles and its politics is indebted to feminist artists, activists, and academics writing in the second half of the 20th century. And I think this seminar is a continuation of that work. The late curator, publisher, and collector, Cez Siegelaub, assembled a library of over 7,000 books on textiles, the majority dating from between the 16th and 19th centuries, which, according to him, is the largest of its kind. The image here is from one of these volumes, which was exhibited in the exhibition I just mentioned. He says, while the technical developments in textile production, such as the large scale mechanization of spinning and weaving of cotton in the late 18th, early 19th century in England were fundamental to the development of capitalism, the overwhelming majority of the books in his collection are instructional, a purely utilitarian consideration of textiles how-to books, 
which point to the lack of a critical discourse. And this is, the, <coughs> this is a, an image of um, 20 or 30 of some of his publications from that collection. In the early 20th century, in the context of debates about architecture and design and their role in modernization, technical development, and the improvement of living standards for society, women from the Bauhaus weaving workshop began to theorize their craft. The image here is of the text Stoff im Raum, Textiles in Space by Otti Berger, which was published in the Czech magazine Red in 1930. At the Bauhaus, despite the stated equality between men and women, the latter were overwhelmingly directed towards the weaving workshop, a space sometimes disparaged by their male counterparts. And they were told to weave because of their supposed lack of spatial awareness. And perhaps this is why Berger chose to write on the subject. But despite or because of this sequestering, Bauhaus weavers produced extraordinary aesthetic and technical advances, and also, as Ty Smith points out, a brand new discourse. Their writing reflects the theorizing of everything at the Bauhaus, largely through the Bauhaus Journal, and in the text by Berger, the left-leaning cooperative principles of the school under Hannes Meyer, with its analysis of the social use of textiles in relation to architecture comes through. In addition, the Bauhaus weavers use this discursive space to reflect on the question and think through the gendered nature of textiles at the school. Gunther Sturzel acknowledges weaving primarily as a woman's field in her 1926 text for Offset, and Helena Nonna Schmidt explores why this might be, looking at some of the characteristics of weaving and their association with the feminine producing what Ty Smith has described as a proto-feminist discussion of weaving, even if in ways that today appear to be essentializing. Textile politics as a strand of feminist politics is one of the assertions made in Brian Wilson's book. And in a recent interview I conducted with curator and art historian Penina Barnett for the project Folded Life, Penina describes how pivotal the feminism of the 1970s was in informing her interest in textiles as a young art student at Leeds School of Art in what was still a largely male-dominated environment. This was catalyzed by the arrival of a new generation of academics at Leeds, including the art historian Griselda Pollock. In the interview, Penina says, we heard that this feminist was coming, so we were expecting someone in dungarees and short hair, and then this beautiful woman with blonde hair and interesting clothes turned up. At that time, she was writing Old Mistresses with Rosika Parker, whom she'd met at the Courtauld Institute, or maybe they'd already written it, but it wasn't published yet. Griselda used material from the book in some of her lectures, and this was an emotional and intellectual turning point. And she says it was instrumental in her decision to focus on textiles. Panina describes the lack of relevant books on textiles in the following way. In the public library, it was mainly how-to books, but there was a Xeroxed type up, typed up copy of the text of Old Mistresses in the Fine Art Department Library. And in the filing cabinet, a photocopy of the spare rib article that Rosika Parker had written in 1975 called The Word for Embroidery Was Work, written before her groundbreaking Subversive Stitch, A History of Embroidery in Europe from 1300 to 1900, which examines shifting ideas of femininity within a wider social history, taking class into account. So this is a um, image of the original copy of Subversive Stitch from 1984, which was from Panina's library of books on, on textiles, which we included alongside the interview. So the project Folded Life responds to the proposition concerning textiles in Julia Bryan Wilson's book Frey, that accounting for objects which are in close contact with us at virtually every minute of the day demands alternative methodologies. 
In this sense, she says, we are all in some way textile specialists. In feminist terms, this imbrication, the linking of textiles to politics, to the everyday, and to devalued and suppressed forms of knowledge, connects to the popular adage that the personal is political. The interviews for Folded Life tease out this kind of knowledge, mapped onto biographies and what this might imply. The conversations begin by asking participants to consider their personal and political engagements with textiles through a textile object of their choice. The proposition here is of textiles as a field of social meaning that is temporarily and spatially ubiquitous, but at the same time alive with personalized references and subjective attachments. And that this interscalar character of cloth positions us in an intimate relationship with the life world and consequently with the political. So the first interviewee for the project um, was with a curator, uh, Christina Kaczynska, who's the curator of African and diasporic textiles at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and she chose for her interview this white cotton Victorian style blouse produced in the 1970s by the English fashion label Laura Ashley that she brought in a sample sale. So by some coincidence, Christine was born and grew up a few streets away from me in the same town. She'd gone through the same experiences of adapting and making clothes as part of the 1980s youth culture, first through the jazz funk scene and then later the new romantics. Had studied textiles at art school and like me had gone on to do a PhD at Goldsmiths. But in the 1990s, Christine had worked as the principal designer at Laura Ashley a label with a retro, quintessentially English, partly William Morris-inspired aesthetic, which grew up from small artisan beginnings to become an iconic cultural as well as economic presence, selling Englishness to the world. In the interview, she describes how even though working with this very narrowly defined framework of Englishness, she enjoyed researching historical materials in the v &A's National Art Library by combing antique markets in Bath and Portobello Road and accessing the Laura Ashley archive of historical samples. At the same time, she said, when she wore the white blouse herself with its pin tucks and ruffles and leg of mutton sleeves and general associations of Englishness, as a woman of color, she confounded expectations. At that time, she said, I hadn't seen the photographs from the Smithsonian archive of black people wearing Victorian dress. But looking back, I would say that it was a political statement to be wearing the blouse in the way that I did, unironed, unbuttoned, with a suit jacket or with baggy Oxford trousers. We talked also about how in the 1980s, the new romantics appropriated some of these same signifiers of Englishness, the frilly shirts, the ruffled skirts. But for them, this continuation was a look, was both a, sorry, this look was both a continuation and a rejection of punk, a queering of it, perhaps, coming out of club culture and filtering through to the regional, to the regional towns like the one where we both grew up. As an adult, she said, this juxtaposition, as well as her role in the company, was contrary to the assumptions about race and class that run through British society. In this context, she mentioned how recently Vogue's first black editor, Edward Eninful, appointed in 2007, was racially profiled on his way to work when he was asked to use the goods lift, and how she herself encountered confusion in the same building, in Vogue House, when she introduced herself as the principal designer at Laura Ashley. She said in the interview, when I, ha when I arrived, I had the distinct feeling of someone almost looking past me, as though I wasn't the one, couldn't be the person from Laura Ashley. Maybe I was introducing the person from Laura Ashley. Maybe I was the driver of the person or the PA. And she explained how these experiences of working in the fashion industry went on to inform her doctoral study, which began by questioning the absence of black people in the fashion canon, 
now using her research skills to undertake the difficult task of gathering information about the clothes worn by enslaved people in the Caribbean. Christine and I worked together on the exhibition Social Fabric, a research project exploring the 19th century British cotton trade. Christine researching images from the Washington Library of Congress of African-American workers transporting cotton from, 19, from 1879. In his 1861 article in the, on the subject in the New York Daily Tribune, Karl Marx points out how British colonialism, colonialism in India and what he calls the slave-consuming oligarchies of the American South were a pivot of the cotton industry and more generally constitutive of the development of industrial capitalism. A fact, he says, that comes into sharp relief during times of crisis, such as the interruption of cotton supplies from plantations in the South brought about by the outbreak of civil war that year and blockage by the North. Likewise, in the repulsion and attraction of work people by the factory system, crisis in the cotton trade, Marx describes how the factory system, through its extensive precar pre precarious reach, responds to economic opportunities and shocks so that the supply of raw material and the disposal of produce become both a national and a global question that is underwritten by colonialism. The exhibition Social Fabric traced this history within a larger history of early capitalism interlinked with colonization. This is set out through texts, drawings, paper cuts, embroidery, beadwork and painted portraits in the installation Apparatus for the Osmotic Compensation of Wealth During the Contemplation of Poverty by Alice Kreischer, which I think was shown in this museum, and maybe is owned by this museum. Um, anyway, Alice has a, quite a long relationship with this museum. So the artist created a mise-en-scene which tracks the flow of resources. It's an, an incredible work. It's a very complex work with many parts using these mediums I just mentioned. Um, and the story of the work um, traces the flow of resources from the silver mines of Portosi via the Spanish national debt to the coffers of the Bank of England and from there through bonds in the British East India Company to the opening up of Indi the Indian market, which paved the way for direct rule. The story of cotton textiles within this can be dated back to the boom in Indian chintz, which was imported into Europe during the 17th century and was wildly popular for its brilliant colors and technical virtuosity. And this tide of imports was stemmed through acts of parliament, importation bans, um, and the, 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 and the levers of direct and indirect rule in India. But the appropriation of colors and motifs from Indian cloth by UK manufacturers who hoped to match its unparalleled technical and aesthetic achievements was helped by the work of John Forbes Watson, a doctor and writer who organized the textile collection of the India Museum a collection that was subsequently relocated to the South Kensington Museum that today is the Victoria and Albert Museum. So 700, 700 swatches of Indian textiles were published in a volume, in 18 volumes called The Textile Manufacturers of India in 1866. So this is an image of the um, display from the exhibition and this is the John Ford Watson book that we had in the exhibition. The resulting, so the, the um, British manufacturers produced this sort of faux Indian chintz using the information brought back by people like uh, uh, John Forbes Watson. Um, and this, in, this was called a Manchester cloth, and it was industrially produced in a way that the Indian manufacturers couldn't, and dumped wholesale onto the Indian market, all but wiping out indigenous production, and hence the role of textiles in the independence movement, Swadeshi, the boycott and burning of English cloth, 
and the designation of Cardi spinners as freedom fighters. In his discussion of the impact of factory produced goods, Marx concludes that wherever the factory system extends itself at the expense of the old handicrafts, the result is as sure as the result between any army furnished with breech loaders and one armed with bows and arrows. So what happens is the settled practice of producing cloth for immediate use or within communities by hand or using simple machinery is replaced by the uncertainty of a global system of supply and demand and the imposition of new technologies uh, that ruin the handicrafts uh, backed up by colonial rule and establishes an international division of labor, forcing producers to switch from exporting raw to exporting raw materials to sustain the English industry rather than make their own cloth. As part of his defense of the artisan, the poet and textile designer, William Morris, wrote about um, the plight of the artisan weaver in India and this reflected the huge importance of South Asian textiles for his own work in terms of their pattern, their color, and their process. And he was able to see Indian textiles in the collection of the South Kensington Museum where he was an advisor. But unlike the producers of Manchester cloth, Morris developed small scale production, which to his own disappointment meant that his fabrics were only ever destined for an elite market. During the 1870s, he collaborated with the manufacturer Thomas Wardle and was able to experiment with the strong natural dyes used in Indian textiles such as indigo and madder. And these you can see in the two different colorways of this textile, which is called Brother Rabbit, which was first printed in the early 1880s. So Morris never visited India, and perhaps, as Priya Sundram and Nia Thandapani have said in their text on his relationship to South Asia, his understanding of the Indian crafts was based on an orientalized notion of a timeless village India. But nevertheless, he was damning about the destruction of craft which was taking place under colonial rule, including, it has to be said, through the establishing of colonial art schools with, its lessons, with lessons provided by the science and art department of the South Kensington Museum. In his book, The Indian Craftsman from 1909, Sri Lankan art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy quotes Morris as saying, so far reaching is the curse of commercial war that no country is safe from its ravages. The traditions of thousands of years fall before it in a month and whatsoever romance or pleasure or art existed there is trodden down in the mire of sordidness and ugliness. The Indian or Japanese craftsman may no longer ply his craft, leisurely working a few hours a day in a, producing a maze of strange beauty on a piece of cloth. So a very orientalized notion, of course. But a steam engine is set up in Manchester and the Asiatic worker if he is not starved to death outright, as plentifully happens, is driven himself into a factory to lower the wages of Manchester brother workers. So the hidden presence of utopian socialist themes um, read into printed fabrics by Morris was the subject of an interview with the art historian Caroline Arscott for Folded Life. She sees his prints as their own form of textile politics, as allegorical works, as well as a form of propaganda, produced after a systematic reading of socialist theory. And she says, they preempt ideas which would later be more fully artic articulated in his political writing. Her chosen textile, which is the one I'm showing here, Brother Rabbit, is in part an homage to Br'er Rabbit, a character featured in the books of Joel Chandler Harris, which Morris read and loved. This rabbit was a trickster from the American South, derived from African mythology, who in fable form sought to subvert the brutal hierarchies of the plantation system. At the same time, 
the brother of the title suggests a comrade and potentially a revolutionary agent, one amongst many. She describes how in the image the rabbit is crouching, surrounded by lush foliage, designating nature as a field of abundance and endless proliferation, as indicated by the potentially infinite pattern of the print. The rabbit appears to be nibbling on an acorn at the root of a tree, and Ask, Ascot reads this, she reads the acorn as a store of energy, a kind of battery which will enable the rabbit to build up the potential to multiply, as rabbits will. Meanwhile, above, the birds perform a vocal act of socialist pro propaganda from the branches of the trees. So I'm coming to the end. The ideas of Morris and Ruskin and the arts and crafts movement were widely influential on the anti-academic thrust of early 20th century reform education that refused the separation of the arts and crafts. The woodblock print of a cathedral by L Lionel Feininger, used for the cover of the 1919 Bauhaus Manifesto, written by Walter Gropius, one year after the German Revolution of 1918, reflects the medievalism of Ruskin and the influence of his text, The Nature of Gothic, indicating in Gropius a yearning for the pre-industrial world of the Bauhutter and the band of craftsmen who built the great cathedrals, and a belief that the arts and crafts would be integral to the revolutionary transformation of society. In an address to the students, Gropius is reported to have called out the words, Bauhaus Gothic India, suggesting that like Morris, he too shared this enthusiasm. For the project Bauhaus Imaginista, co-curated with Marion von Austin, which looked at the transcultural roots and relations and reception of the Bauhaus, we juxtapose the pedagogical work of early Bauhaus with its emphasis on the crafts with Kalabavan, an art school established by the poets Rabindranath Tagore at Shantiniketan in West Bengal, an art school um, in the same year. Here, the revival of resist died Batik was incorporated into the school's curriculum by the artist Surendranath Kar, who had accompanied Tagore on his visit to Indonesia in 1927, where they had, been, where, where they had witnessed demonstration of the craft in Java and were gifted 10 works of Indonesian batik. As Indian art historian Gita Kapoor points out, Kumaraswamy was in active alliance with Tagore and his circle during the early decades of the 20th century during the incepting of Shantiniketan. She says, in his investigation of medieval craftsmanly traditions, he ran his thesis along lines forwarded by 19th century socialists such as Morris, dismissing the separate category of fine art in favor of living art, with tradition as a resource of material practices and iconographic frames. So to finish, I want to just go back to this discussion of textiles and text um, and look at this work, which is a woven textile by the artist Raisa Kabir, who lives in London, called Lift the Veil and See Our Silent Language. So I interviewed Raisa for the Folded Life interview project. And our, discuss, our conversation touched on many of the things that I've already mentioned this evening. So Riza grew up in Manchester, a city whose bones, she says, are enti entwined with textile history, the remains of an industrial legacy. It is a place full of buildings with names such as India House, Velvet House, and Silk House. But as a child taken to see the cotton mills and warehouses which had sprung up during and after the Industrial Revolution, she did not immediately connect them to her family, history, and the fact that her parents had migrated to the UK from Bangladesh. Then she said the penny dropped when she was studying textiles at Chelsea College of Art, and she attended a lecture on the East India Company as part of a course on textile history. And she figured out that 
the East India Company as part of a, sorry, she figured out that East India must also mean Bangladesh. Her subsequent work has often been an attempt to understand these histories that loop back and around. For example, she has taken the John Ford Watson textile manufacturer books, which I showed earlier, to diaspora communities living in ex-mill towns such as Burnley and Blackburn. And she says, many people who came to the UK in the wake of the traumatic events of partition in 1947 were leaving countries where textile production had been swamped by industrial produced goods made in the north of England, only to find themselves working in the mills of Manchester and Lancashire. Her work also includes an examination of what often gets excluded from the representation of South Asian women through textiles, she says, which for her are the queer, femme, women's voices that link identity, link to identity, so that textiles become a metaphor and a hidden archive. And she says of this particular piece, I made it in response to describing the lived realities and multiple voices of being queer. The hidden coded voices and histories of South Asian women always being seen as heterosexual. The idea of Indian patterned fabrics being situated as, as innocuous or reflecting traditional ideas in some way. The work appears to feature a decorative woven pattern but as she says, on a second look, the language of queerness is hidden in the cloth. And those that can read the Bengali script can read what is coded and written in the textile, which is a poem that she wrote. Okay. Thank you so much, that was very nice. And thank you also, Natasha, for your generosity. I really enjoyed both presentations and I think kind of uh, combine what we have yesterday with what we have today. I think it makes uh, perfect sense to kind of bring the discussion about textile politics and finish with the idea of poetry, which is what we're going to see right after with um, Luth Pitel. Um, I think uh, the histories of violence, the histories of uh, migration, uh, all these histories that had to do with the ecological uh, turnal that we have to embrace and many of these textile discussions also relate to, uh, is very relevant and have emerged in both uh, presentations from the stories of uh, Morris uh, from many years ago to um, the presentation that Natasha made with recent uh, and young artists uh, developing work um, for Columbus Cope. Uh, so I think it's very interesting, this idea of intimacy, sense of belonging. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and, and thank you both for your uh, beautiful and comprehensive presentations. And I think we have a, an opportunity to open up a, a conversation with the audience in case uh, they have questions or comments. And also among you two, uh, uh, if there's anything you really wanna comment uh, together, because we still have a few more minutes. And uh, yeah, I think it will be amazing if um, any of you feel like um, commenting or question uh, both Natasha and Grant. In the meantime, yeah, thank you again. <laughs> There's a question. I don't know if Natasha is able to see the audience. Oh, amazing, um, great. I can't see the audience, but I can hear you very well. Okay, so we have a question right at the back. Lorenzo Sandoval. Hi, Natasha, and hi, Grant. Thank you very much for the presentations. They were both uh, very inspiring and amazing. Um, my question has to do, in both cases, we understand uh, textiles, alt uh, textiles as text, uh, also like related to the, to the political, no? And uh, and that's uh, which, which I agree to as well. But I find it also problematic in the sense of um, the codifications of the textiles. Um, so to read a textile, you need a very specific code. And being a political text, uh, how do you think about the 
uh, saving the literacy it contains and the processes of uh, translation it requires. Natasha, do you want to? Did you? Sure. sure. Um, I'm happy to take that first. Um, you know, I I think this is also it's a it's a really um, it's a challenging question. But I kind of felt when I was sharing from, uh, you know, starting with this 15th century uh, figure, who was um, a weaver, a poet, a mystic. In a sense, Kabir, his. Uh, the way in which he transmitted um, sort of, let's say, spiritual guidance, uh, just uh, to make it shorthand, um, was through, in a sense, an oral transmission, but then also through this kind of trained knowledge of weaving. And um, both operated in tandem. And I use that example in the very beginning uh, also to gesture at the fact that when we when we address textiles, we can actually um, substantiate that by a certain kind of uh, social and visual literacy, by a certain kind of oral practice that travels uh, and is transmitted for generations that can, in fact, even sort of uh, operate in a way that it works uh, you know, between different religious groups and ethnic groups uh, in in rather fractured uh, geographies. Um, and so I think even the way that some of these artists that I, I shared from, I mean, of course, there is there is a sense of expertise. I mean, as we know, I mean, textile and text, it's not just that, it's also the fact of, of uh, counting and, uh, you know, uh, your interest as well, Lorenzo, in kind of really thinking also of mathematics of uh, quantum strategies of you know many ways in which we are really thinking about textile as that um, grid work in which all of these questions come into account but beyond that it it does have um, particularly the the sense of building a web that is larger and more expansive that that connects communities that may not have the specialized knowledge. And I think that is what we're trying to also bring forward today. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think I'll you know, follow that up. Um, I think maybe the, for me, the question is to do with specificity of textile and context and also scale, because I think there are, there are different modes of reading textiles. So, you know, one of the ones that I was trying to communicate in this paper was this idea of a kind of the uh, you know that you have a um, that there's this particular knowledge that we all have about textiles because we live with textiles we, we we have very these very close sort of you know sensory haptic relationships with textiles and so that that kind of knowledge is one that's sort of embodied and in some ways you know it's it's a kind of absolute form of knowledge you know it's what it can't be contested on some level um, and then secondly, if you go to the complete other end of the scale, if you look at someone like Karl Marx, I mean, it was really a kind of analysis of, you know, pages and pages and pages of the cotton industry in the mid 19th century, how many bales were being bought of cotton were being brought from the American South. You know, what was the tariff on cotton being ex imported into the UK from India? Um, so that's a completely different kind of reading. And then I think in the middle, there's maybe this sort of reading which Natasha alluded to, which is sort of the, the specificity of the technique of weaving. And then I think of somebody like Annie Albers, you know, and, and, and her insistence on um, textile and text. Um, and in a way, um, you know, sort of actually looking back to, in a problematic way, I think, to kind of Peruvian practices which Natasha alluded to through the work of um, Cecilia Vicuña in this sort of project of thinking about the kipu, what does the kipu mean? How can we read it as a, as a communicative device? Um, so I think there isn't any one single answer. I think you, know, you have to kind of look at the textile example and then think about what's the reading and who's making that reading. Thanks for the question, <laughs> good question. Is there any other questions? 
just thinking about the work of Teresa, of course, because it's one of the reasons why we're here, but of course this idea of language and translation and, and how um, this goes towards collective memory and experience, I think is also important in thinking about how to translate those um, patterns, those forms that, of course, if we look at the way she has developed uh, the Middle Atlas, but also the 15th century uh, tapestries really resonate with um, limitations and narratives that develop uh, the understanding of what they mean. But as Bona mentioned yesterday, I think there's something about, uh, and also Natasha, when she said that the idea of the cloth as the second skin and what just Grant mentioned, I think there's something that is inherent to the practice. So it's a contradiction at the same time, but there's the possibility of understanding there. So there's no, it's not a very easy um, answer, but it's a very rich question at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Natasha again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so there's like something quite interesting in relation with the work of Teresa. Uh, like, um, like she defines uh, the weaving as an open quote. Uh, and in that question, actually, like uh, thinking about a history of industrialization and its, its relation with textile fabrication, uh, I think that like, we can think of uh, two different processes. Uh, one, it's the process of accumulation. The other one, it's the process of redistribution. Um, redistribution, thinking about how to think textiles as the writing of the commons. Mm. Uh, so I want to ask you both uh, your position in, in, in this idea of uh, putting together commons and textile making. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Good. Mm. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, well, I think, I think, I mean, on, on the one hand, there's the sort of uh, a, a, a kind of work going on, which um, is is you know, <coughs> I'm I'm not so connected to it, or I don't know so much about it. But there's this whole kind of thing of craftivism, no? I mean, there's a sort of generation of craft people who are kind of working collectively, um, using craft both as a kind of resource to produce material goods that can be shared and used. Um, but also in a kind of protest context. So I think their textiles comes in, in, into the common. I mean, I think it's, it's sort of interesting that, you know, Morris, um, and this is, this is one of the things that I was thinking about, was this, you know, if there's this big critique of industrial production and accumulation, which you describe, on the other hand, you know, the efforts by Morris to kind of create a different material culture failed because he could only ever sell his work in very high-end kind of Kensington boutiques. Um, and, I, and, 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 I, and I think, I don't know, maybe Natasha, you have interesting examples of projects where, um, you know, textiles are through a kind of community context become um, an important part of uh, commoning. Um, I mean, I'm thinking maybe of some of those, maybe you know Natasha a bit more, but some of those projects that uh, we looked at in the Bauhaus Imaginista in Gujarat and Rajasthan, where textile designers were working with uh, weavers to use that as kind of regeneration projects, as did, I suppose, Tagore in, in Shantaniketan and Sriniketan. Um, so I think their textiles was very much a commoning project, no? Um, yeah, I, I guess just to, since, yeah, we've kind of come more specific in terms of, uh, you know, providing uh, examples, um, I I just, one is I, I was really drawn to that um, reference of um, Teresa really mentioning also the rug and its economy and the kind of labor uh, built around it in terms of hours and uh, also then, but then how to think also of particularly this this kind of mode of um, shared experiences of learning of transmitting techniques and um, knowing fully well that you know that, that there's something about that temporality which exceeds the the sort of nature of uh, you know these uh, these textile artifacts as 
as units. I think when we when we um, open up, um, then then there are ways in which, like what Grant was indicating, you know, there are there have been for for decades. Um, a design school, for instance, in Gujarat, the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad um, has has seen um, young designers, design students uh, travel to um, the villages in Gujarat to Kutch in particular, and to engage in a process in which um, you know old motifs might be revived, uh, where there is the possibility to learn about natural dyeing, which actually has created a whole sort of uh, resurgence to to the extent possible. Um, that also creates uh, a sense of uh, of different engagement, really, with textile and color uh, today in India, and an appreciation and understanding of it that is more nuanced. Um, and that also this idea of generational learning, mm. um, that is something that can be sometimes quite simplistic and quite also um, can become oppressive. So we also have to kind of understand what what it means to come from a from a family, come from a certain lineage, come from a certain caste in which that uh, that profession is sort of assigned to you and when do you also choose it or when do you perhaps choosing a collaborator perhaps you know when does that unleash a new mode of creativity in which you are then not only confined to the production of the unit um and i i just wanted to you know mention that and i i just one end with one example you know when you talk about skill um the skill set and you know we can we can talk about weaving as 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 uh, an open source and all of this, but I just I remember this moment uh, when I was at a, a craft, a handicraft and textile uh, fair in Chennai. I was a journalism student, and the the master dyer who had come with all his textiles needed to go and uh, do his prayers to do his namaz, um, and he said. Can you stay here and can you take care of the sales? You know, I was terrified, um, and I I realized that I I had understood the techniques, but the thing that I could not do was to tear the the cloth by hand, and they literally he had no scissors. You no, know? so this is a very simple thing, but when we talk about haptic knowledge, it goes down to this very basic thing of how do you tear fabric in a straight line without a scissor and he was surprised that, that that i don't know how to do that you know so i think we need to yeah we need to sometimes go to these essentials um and then start to question again where does the collaboration occur where does the lapse in our knowledge occur in terms of the lives that we have inherited or chosen to live by um you know the privilege we live by uh so yeah i just wanted to mention I think also the other thing just that occurred to me was this this <clears throat> the kind of in a way the kind of minor status of textiles is part of its value you know the way that that textiles and when we were walking around the exhibition and talking about how you know at a certain point even 10 15 years ago to hang tapestries in the Reign of Sophia was considered problematic you know they're sort of not considered to be somehow full of you know status have status um, but I mean, the positive thing of that is that they also uh, people are comfortable with textiles. You know, they 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 they're not pretentious actually, and um, they can be great scenarios for convening conversations. Um, and and one conversation, that one uh, incident I, I was thinking of was as part of this interviews. I I, st I started to interview this group of embroiderers. Um, in East London, they're called the East London Textile Arts. They're, they do really, really nice work. And they're mostly in their 70s and even 80s. They're mostly from South Asia. Um, and somehow kind of joining that group on a weekly basis where they were sitting around embroidering and I was able to ask them questions about their histories, fascinating stories that very much track some of these colonial lines of you know, migrations via Africa, via East Africa to the United Kingdom coming to work in the National Health Service. But those com somehow textiles allowed the right kind of space for those conversations to happen. And to, you could somehow overstep some of the 
the boundaries of the demographic boundaries that might have interrupted those conversations. Um, so that's another form of commoning, I think. How are we with time? <clears throat> ¿Cómo vamos con el tiempo? Are we good? Mal. <laughs> okay. I think we, we need to be yeah, to, be, to come to an end. Um, okay. If there's any final question, otherwise I think I'll uh, invite you to join Teresa and Luth in the poetry reading upstairs. We're just going to follow um, Yolanda right at the back <laughs> and we go to the second floor. Thank you very much, Natasha and Grant again for today's presentation. <laughs> Thank you. And looking forward to seeing in Castle. <laughs> <laughs> Good night for you. <laughs> are you are we yeah. saying goodbye? I think so, yeah. I uh, can you can you see us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to just say thank you to Yolanda and, and the technicians and everybody for making this as smooth as possible um, and enjoy the poetry. <laughs> thank Speak you so much. Speak soon. Bye. Speak soon. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>